I'm Savannah Pratt, and for the next half hour, we will discuss an issue that is both disturbing and close to home. We will meet face to face with women that survived sex trafficking and the people that are working hard to end modern day slavery. Somewhere in the state of Georgia tonight, there are people that are flat on their back, that someone is sexually abusing them, and they're looking at the door wondering who's coming through it. After the first time of being sold, I, I don't remember feeling anything but worthless after that. First time he put me on a strip club stage, I was 15, but when he was gone, the bouncer wouldn't let me leave. He would give them injections to numb them. They wouldn't feel the penetration, and it would just go on for hours and hours, and men after men after men. And a lot of people still believe that you have to go to Kim to witness sex trafficking. It's right here in America. It's right here in your backyards. I absolutely saw all the other girls get beaten or gang raped or tortured because that way we knew what happened when we didn't make it. There are people today now that go, she can just leave. It's not that simple to just leave. And sex trafficking and sexual exploitation is an issue everywhere. One of America's most recognized cities for sex trafficking is here, Atlanta, Georgia. The women we we're about to speak to were lured into the world of exploitation in their adolescence by men that said they wanted to be their boyfriends and take care of them. This world quickly escalated into a nightmare that was not easy to escape. One of the things that I want people to really understand in regards to um, trafficking is that it always starts as a child. Uh, and my father was in and out of prison and my mother's only child and she raised me alone. The first time I was raped, I was 12 and it was three boys who had talked me into having sex and I thought it was my fault. I was 12. I couldn't consent. Tawan began running away from home at 12 years old. The last time I ran away I was 15 and that's when I met my first pimp and I didn't, I did know he was a pimp but I didn't know what was going to happen to me if that makes sense. When he took me home there were four girls there and two of them worked streets and truck stops and the other two worked in strip clubs. Our apartment was right around the corner off of Industrial Boulevard. Tawan believed he loved her more because he was only asking her to sell drugs. And that's how I made my quota. And we all had a quota to make, and um, if you didn't make quota, you were punished, but your punishment didn't happen in private. Your punishment, we were made to watch the other girls be punished. And there were many times I didn't make quota. And yes, many times I was beaten. And so for the first few weeks, I'm selling drugs and making my quota, and then one particular night, he drops me off and gives me the drugs, and there's not enough drugs to make quota. So the tables had turned. And yes, I physically submitted to being paid for sex at 15 years old. It was paid rape, every single time. Tawan was first sold in the heartbeat of the South, Atlanta, Georgia. But sex trafficking isn't just a big city problem. It also happens in rural Georgia. And that's what we learn when we talk to Rachel. They don't come up and say, hey, I'm gonna be your pimp. It usually starts off as a boyfriend type scenario. I really care about you, I really love you. And at the age of 12, my stepfather became very abusive, verbally and mentally, and my, my dad molested me. And he denied it when he was confronted, and that took a toll on me that um, it was a, another pivotal point in my life because I had lost all self-respect, I felt disgusting. What started off as a seemingly harmless relationship with a fellow student quickly escalated into trafficking. You know, I had no purpose, no point in living. I didn't make good grades. I didn't have good friends. My father molested me. My stepfather hated me. I had no drive in life, no purpose. So 15 years old, I had zero self-respect because no one in my life was building me up. I was just crying out for someone to show me some attention. And uh, the boy was the same age as me. So I, at the age of 14, for the first time, I was exploited. And there's always a, a misconception with what human trafficking is. You can traffic a person as far as from me to you. It doesn't necessarily mean across borders and all of that. I was trafficked at the age of 14 in a small town between three men for drugs. The men, the Johns, are not some creepy guy coming out of a basement, like just some weirdo, drug dealer looking guy. No, no, no. They're suit and tie men with families most of the time. I'm 
I-20 stretches across 1,500 miles, and in one fluid line, it connects together most of the South's major cities. Because of this, it has become known as the sex trafficking superhighway. Tawan was sold and transported by truck on this very route. Driving to Birmingham from Atlanta is two, two and a half hours. Well, it may take us three days because you're sold at every single exit. And with the, the cities that it hits, there's lots of money there and there's lots of money to be made. Additionally, Tawan was sold on the Southeastern Circuit. We did a circuit from Birmingham, Atlanta, Memphis, Nashville, and Chattanooga, I don't know how many times. Our transportation would be truck drivers, rental cars. Usually our pimp was never with us. We were in separate vehicles. I have been sold in every state but Alaska and Hawaii, and I've been sold in Canada and Mexico too. It also keeps you away from for family and friends and all that are. So you, you don't have, I mean, I didn't know anybody in Birmingham. So all of that is, is strategic, this plan. I, mean, I can remember being in Atlanta in 1995. There was about 10 pimps sitting around the dining room table in this apartment, and, and they were planning what, how they were going to approach the 1996 Olympics that were coming. Rachel was lured into the world of exotic dancing because of the big money she was told she would make. So I started dancing. And the down world spiral just sped up. And when I started doing that, I remember driving to the club and like crying out saying, you know, I, I don't want to do this, but I have to do this because at some point I started believing that that's all I could do because it started at 12 that I thought I was useless. Things looked so pretty on the outside, but I was so broken on the inside. And so after a year passed and the world's not so glamorous anymore and things aren't so glamorous anymore when your two-year-old son is taking care of you, you're hungover every day and you're sick and you don't know how many men, you know, seen you naked the night before. One night, a woman that worked with For Sarah came to the club and spoke with Rachel on the same night she was planning to commit suicide. There was my, my best friends that I worked with and I was telling them, I was like, just really sad. And I was like, are you not sad? Does this place not make you sad? I remember like six girls I was talking to and I just said to myself, I'm just gonna wreck my car on I-75 and I'll drive off the bridge and it'll just be over, it'll be done. And I had my stuff like, I was going out the door and I seen the church ladies come in and I didn't want to talk to them. So I had all my stuff and they come in and they like circle the room. And I like, I'm gonna make a dart for the door. <laughs> and my, my now mentor, she comes over and uh, she's like, hey, how are you? And they kind of knew me because they had been coming in for the past year, but I was usually drunk. So like I had never got to know any of these ladies. And she comes over and she's like, hey, how are you? And I, I was so rude. And I just was like, you don't want to know how I'm doing. And she was like, actually, I do. I kind of walked through everything that was happening and I started realizing like, you're never gonna get out of this place. After that night, Rachel did not commit suicide. She instead went into a rehab center called Wellspring Living. During the time at Wellspring, I learned job skills, people skills, social skills, how to carry myself, how to act dressed, how to act and dress, and all these just surface type things that we should just know and uh, learn just the basics of living, just the basics of life, you know. I did have a little bit of education, but some of the girls didn't have any. And then they had to learn from the very bottom. If it seems that sex trafficking is only something that happens under the cloak of darkness, well, we're headed down I-20 to go to Birmingham and meet with a team that goes out in the middle of the day to find sex trafficking victims. We go to the motels and we go to the truck stops 
and we really want to reach the women being held captive. Lisa and a group of volunteers with the Well House go out to look for victims of sex trafficking and offer them a way out. We believe that when the women are released and, and they find refuge with our 24-hour shelter, they find freedom from being held under conditions that are so deplorable. It's mind-boggling what we've been able to see here in Woodlawn. And why sex trafficking is so profitable is you can sell a drug once, but you can sell a woman or a child 30 times a day. So within the next five years, sex trafficking will overcome drug trafficking as the number one crime in the world. Why are we, I mean, we're right here in front of a motel. Why are we having to stand on the sidewalk? Why are we not able to just walk over there and talk to them? This is private property and we've damaged their profits. And they'll tell us this directly. We know that the Johns that come in for the services of the women offer say five to ten dollars to the motel manager before they're allowed entrance well with your television cameras with all this attention the john stopped coming in just today a woman the woman that crossed the street to meet us okay there, she told us there are two women in here that they're beating into submission to go on the internet and have men come here to have sex with them that's, that's in the middle of the day, a work, the normal work week for most people, in the sunshine, on a weekday, right up underneath our noses. How often do you guys see girls that are branded here? I've seen it a couple times. I've seen it. I'll tell you how evil it is. Beautiful, blonde, just girl that looked like a model. It had to be 15, 16 years old when we were at the truck stop had one of those brandings, and she climbed out of a truck with that on her, right in front of us. And we're praying. Because of organizations like Street Grace, Georgia is working to enact laws that will change the playing field for purchasers. House Bill 341 will heighten the penalties for Johns and has already passed the House and the Senate. Now it awaits Governor Dill's signature. It's the first time that we've taken language that separates out those who would buy sex, particularly those who would buy sex with minors, but those who would buy sex. So it creates a different set of penalties and a different set of um, fines and, um, and punishments for those who are purchasers of sex. Why has Street Grace decided to become a part of the prevention side versus like having a safe house or something of that nature? If we're going to eradicate the domestic minor sex trafficking of children, you have to end the demand. It's money driven, it's a financial equation, and if you want to stop it, you have to stop it at the source. So we've taken the traffickers, who we've always primarily dealt with, and we've addressed that, and now for the first time, we've separated out those who would buy sex, so that they specifically know that no longer are they off the radar screen. It sends a very loud message to the people of Georgia and the people of this nation, especially those who would be buyers of sex, who to date, have primarily relied upon being able to hide underneath some kind of cloak of anonymity. And so this is a very specific message to those folks that says this will no longer be tolerated. And in Georgia, the penalties related to that are, are quite significant. I mean, someone could serve 10 to 20 years in prison, they could see fines of up to $100,000. And in HB 341, for the first time, it says um, anyone who's arrested for this will spend a minimum of 24 hours in jail. So you won't be, you won't be ticketed, cited, and then go home for dinner. We partner with a number of organizations around Atlanta, um, private and not-for-profit, and create the annual anti-sex trafficking lobbying day. This is our eighth year. We just completed it in February of this year. We had over 700 people from the community that showed up. We had the highest number of uh, folks involved, the highest number of legislators that have come to speak and the largest representation. So it's a really, really neat day. It's a day where um, I guess awareness meets action and the community comes together. We all wear a, a purple scarf so that you can identify us when there's several hundred of us walking around the Capitol. We go across the street, we meet with the legislators, we're invited into the General Assembly and we listen and participate as they review. Uh, this year for us it was HB 341, but it was the Human Trafficking Initiative that we had this year. So it's a really 
it's a really neat day when you see a bunch of people from different backgrounds coming together, one voice, one cause, one purpose, um, and there's clarity of mission, and it's, it's quite impactful when you, when you get an opportunity to kind of look around, especially in the capital, and you see hundreds of people walking around with a purple scarf. So fast forwarding a little bit, when okay. House Bill 341 is uh, approved by the governor, if it is, what will that mean for sex trafficking victims in Georgia? I think it's a very loud statement. Uh, it, when the governor signs this into law, um, it, it, is, it is encouragement for those who are survivors and have been there and have felt like this piece of this equation was not being dealt with sufficiently and was not being dealt with properly and they saw their buyers walk away. They saw their buyers even as recently as 15, 16 years ago get a $50 fine and a misdemeanor. Now to know that that person could spend 10 to 20 years in prison, that they could see fines of up to $100,000, um, I mean every one of them is supportive of this. Tawan was arrested at 26 and instead of returning to her pimp when she was released, she ended up trying to escape the world of sex trafficking. That's when she met Lisa that worked at the Dream Center in Birmingham. And one day the door burst open with an angry young woman who walked in and said, what is a dream center and what do you do? And I said, we do tutoring and mentoring and Bible studies. And we want to reach the women who appear to be being held captive in sex trafficking. And she said, well, you're going about it all wrong. You're dressed wrong. How you're approaching it is wrong and you're going to get killed. And I said, wonderful. Will you work with me? Will you tell me how to go about reaching these women? I need to learn. She loved me. She gave me an unconditional love I'd never seen in my life before. And so I sat down and took notes from Tawan for about two hours and learned that she had been forced by a pimp or so-called boyfriend to be trafficked all along the motels that you're seeing here today in Woodlawn. She pointed out to First Avenue North and said, the woman you're trying to reach is me. Now these two women work together. Tawan opened the well house in 2012, and Lisa leads the street outreach team. I had started the crisis line, and um, it was coming to my cell phone. Um, nobody was calling it because I wasn't doing any advertising or anything. I mean, there was nothing. I wasn't trying to get the number out. And um, then I got an email from Greece that connected me to Detroit. That connected no, I got an email from Greece that connected me to San Francisco. That connected me to Los Angeles. That connected me to Detroit about a girl who could possibly be in uh, Mobile, but she wound up being in Pensacola, and that was on January 27th of 2011, and she wound up calling me on the crisis line, first call I'd ever gotten, and then she says, "If you don't get me, I'm gonna I'm gonna die. Either I'm gonna kill myself or he's gonna kill me." And so I couldn't even buy her a bus ticket to get to me. Somebody bought a bus ticket for her. And she came the next morning and well house opened. And I, I had $33 and I was on food stamps feeding my family in this house. She's doing so well. It was relief when she came, when she showed up. She couldn't believe it. She works for a law firm now. And she's got tattoos all over her face. And somebody asked her the other day, um, said something about, well, did you get your tattoos removed? She says, no, I just have really good makeup. <laughs> um, but she's doing great. She changed my life. And I was able to help a girl like me in a different capacity than the other ones I'd been able to help. But also it placed a responsibility on me. So now I've got to take care of her. And every single time I wanted to quit, I'd get another phone call. On those days that I was really going to quit, that I'm like, I'm shutting, shutting it down. I can't do this. I'd get another phone call and it would be another girl and I couldn't say no to life. We opened in 2011, and while I was a director, up until 2014, I rescued over 200 to 250 women and girls. Um, since then, we've probably rescued anywhere between three to 400. Tawana and Rachel were able to escape sex trafficking and found the lives that they deserve. But there are still so many girls lost in the world of sex trafficking here in Atlanta, Georgia. If you want to get involved with stopping and preventing sex trafficking, go to the links below to contact Street Grace and Wellspring Living, where you too can be involved with ending modern day slavery.
We are only 4,817 miles away from kids in Sierra Leone. I've learned that we really aren't that different. We are united through our humanity. Kids my age were courageous enough to send the videos I am about to show you. Hi, my name is Amphis Makasi. I'm 15 years old. I like to play football. <laughs> hey, my name is Love. I love to cook, sing, and play video games. And I beat her in Just Dance 3. <laughs> All of it. Hi, my name is Anasuna Bangwa. I like to my my name is Sonia Victor. I play bass and violin. I'm 11. Hi, my name is Dora Kekuruma. I'm 18 years old. I to play volleyball and please my mom. Hi, my name is Triana. I'm 13 years old. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor. Hi, my name is Alan Ejalo. I'm 16. I want to become a medical doctor because to save plenty of lives. I used to go for a walk in the evening, but now no more walking and no more talking with friends, no more visiting elder people. Like for example, I used to visit my grandmother in the evening, but now that is no more allowed. Before Ebola, the country was peaceful. And since this Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, everything has gone backward. The school I used to go to and the people whom I used to meet with are no more because of this Ebola outbreak. Can you imagine not being able to be with your friends and family? not being able to go to a loved one's house. In Sierra Leone, schools are closed. People are allowed to gather or congregate in public. I'm scared of getting Ebola because it's like we are fighting a war without seeing our enemy. And because of that, I'm so sad. Ebola is real and we are in the crisis presently. And it is the only clinic that is operating presently in this entire work region. So many clinics have been closed due to um, lack of knowledge on this Ebola problem. The goggles, the mask, the boots, the elbow gloves, the scrubs, the gowns to protect us. They need your help. It doesn't matter how big or small we are, but we are going to show you what they are going through. We are kids from Atlanta, Georgia. Now that we know about something, my mom always said, you know better, you do better. Yeah. So now that we know what's going on, and, and we know the concerns and the voices of these people, it's, it's our responsibility as citizens to help spread that word. It's like, in a way, can do it, like, it's like, I'm gonna yeah, do like this. There's a way to help them. There's a way to help. There's a way for everything. There's 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 never a greater time to help someone than when they are in need. Do something, do something, do something, let's do something. Do something, do something, gotta do something. Do something, do something, we can do something. Everybody, let's do something. We're all the same. More than just a video, this is a call to stand up. Human race, our people, it's time to take care of us. So with our medical supplies, money or time, it's all worth it just to help save somebody's life. So let's not be distant, America. Kids of the future, I hope you listen, America. Do something, do something, do something, let's do something. Something, do something, gotta do something, do something, do something, we can do something. Everybody, let's do something, do something, do something, do something, let's do something, do something, do something, gotta do something, do something, do something, we can do something. Everybody, let's do something. Everybody, let's
you know what would you do